Channel's Week in Review. A rocket attack on Israel for the first time in months, getting your nails done with a Torah twist, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now on this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Israel has been struck by a rocket fired from Gaza for the first time in three months. No injuries were reported despite some property damage. The rocket landed in an industrial area of the southern city of Ashkelon and is the first rocket to strike Israel since a ceasefire was brokered to conclude last November's conflict between Israel and various groups firing rockets from Gaza. The Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades claimed responsibility for the attack. That group was one of several launching rockets into Israel in November. A statement from the group said the rocket attack was a response to the death of a Palestinian man in an Israeli prison. The group claimed the man, Arafat Jaradat, was tortured by Israel and died as a result. Israel denies those claims. Where the rocket might normally have been tracked and perhaps intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system, there was no Iron Dome battery in the area, as it had been redeployed since November, with the threat level in Ashkelon being perceived as low. No warning sirens were sounded either, perhaps because the rocket was not fired into a residential area. Of course, the attack also comes soon after the announcement of President Barack Obama's planned late March visit to Israel and Palestine, where the president is set to meet with both Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, and is expected to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian peace process with both of them. On that topic, newly installed Secretary of State John Kerry spoke of the president's likely approach to the peace process in the March visit. We're not going to go and sort of plunk a plan down and tell everybody what they have to do, Kerry said, adding, I want to consult and the president wants to listen. But the civil unrest caused in Israel by policies allowing for discrimination against women was calmer this week, as Purim celebrations, including a women's reading of the Megillah at the Western Wall, was held without incident. This came less than two weeks after several women were arrested at the holy site for wearing prayer shawls. One of those arrested was American Rabbi Robin Fryer Bodzin, who came to TJC Studios for the latest episode of The Salon. Here's what she had to say about that experience. I was on a trip, a rabbinic cabinet trip from Jewish Federations of North America, and I was in Jerusalem, 15 minutes away from the Kotel, and about 15 of us decided to join Women of the Wall. Two women and the rest were men who were there behind and, and uh, next to us. The davening was beautiful. We davened. So I just want to make sure. So the men were also in the women's section? No, they were on their section, they but they were right beside the mechitza as close as possible. The, so the dividing line between the men's and the women's Absolutely. section. Absolutely. And we davened a beautiful shacharit, and we sang the beautiful praises of, of Hallel, which is done on Rosh Chodesh. And then, as is the custom, this group that meets, they leave the hotel and they move around the side to Robinson's Arch for the Torah service. So, and Robinson's Arch, we should just explain for, for viewers who aren't aware of it, is next to the hotel, not quite the hotel, but the part that's supposed to be reserved for egalitarian prayer. Right. And as soon as we left through the metal detectors that are right by that gate in the old city, a police officer asked for my papers. She, sa she said, to Dad Zahut, which is Hebrew for identity papers. And I said, I don't have any, I'm Canadian. And then she said, passport. She asked for my passport. And I had seen a different officer take someone else's papers away as well. And then someone whispered in my ear, just go with it. Because I guess, you know, getting in a fight with a police officer on your last day of Israel is not always the best thing to do. So we, there are three of us at this point. We followed this police officer to a small police station. I have to ask you, were you wearing a talit? Were you wearing a prayer shawl? My shawl? talit was actually, I usually wear it just over my whole body, but I had it, I was wearing it like a scarf so as not to cause attention to me. The talit that I wear every morning, it's white, it's gray, it's subdued. It's not bright and colorful. It doesn't call attention to me. Um, and I was also wearing a hat on my head because it was cold. So I wasn't even wearing a kippah that was obvious for the whole world to see. You know, I didn't want to call attention. I knew that in the past, Woman of the Wall had situations where men would throw chairs over or dirty diapers over. And I didn't want that to happen to me. I wanted mm -hmm. to go in Davin and then go to my slew of meetings that I had planned that day, which didn't happen. Because? Because I spent the morning in the police station with 10 other women who were detained. Under what, on what grounds? We were detained for wearing a talit, which may violate public safety. May violate public safety. Of all How the things you? to violate public safety in Israel, 
I'm not sure that's one of them. Yeah, how do you <laughs> violate public safety? I'm with you on that. I'm missing what's going on there. Moving on, the recent holiday of Purim saw many dressing up in costume, and now there's a way to add a little Jewish flavor to manicures all year round. Meredith Gansman reports. Nothing says a new season, a new year, a new you, quite like a fresh coat of paint. For my nails, of course. But I don't need just any ordinary manicure. I'm talking about a manicure of biblical proportions. The Torah is divided into 54 weekly parshiot, or portions, and for each, Rabbi Yael Buchler produces a very unique midrash, or interpretation of the weekly Torah story, a manicure. At first, people found it interesting, um, and then they would become more inspired for it. Um, for example, during synagogue, people would come up to me afterwards at Kiddush and say, I was reading through the Torah portion and trying to figure out what were on your nails. Buchler paints her nails with symbols for the week's Bible story or Jewish holiday. So each fingernail became a canvas for creativity with Torah. She's also developed Midrash manicure workshops for young girls to connect with the Torah in new and meaningful ways. These workshops reach girls where they're at in terms of their passions, and that's really important. The best way to combine Jewish education and nail art is with your girlfriends. When we met with Rabbi Buchler in the fall, we had Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Noah's Ark-themed manicures on our minds. We have the whale for Jonah, the scroll of life, and justice, and then finally, for kicks, it's on the 10th day of Tishrei. To see more from Rabbi Yael Buchler's Midrash Manicures, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, are you a Jewish American or an American Jew? It's a question so many of us have heard and contemplated. More food for thought is delivered by Chaim Lappin, a professor of Jewish studies at the University of Maryland and author of the book Rabbis as Romans, which examines how that very question of Jewish identity can be taken back 2,000 years. Lappin stopped by TJC Studios recently for an interview, and here are the highlights. Now, what you write here cuts to the very core of Jewish identity in the sense that everyone in America, I'm sure, with everyone watching this, has heard that basic question, are you an American Jew or a Jewish American? I'm Bert from summer camp. And, uh, <laughs> and what, you what you find is, or what you show is, something that we ignore a lot about Jewish history and the development of Jewish identity, that in Palestine, under Roman rule, uh, for 600 years that you cover, uh, that you could have asked the same question. Are we Jewish Romans or are we Roman Jews? And that's a question that's not really been explored. Well, yeah, and that's, I think, the, the big question in how people do the history of Judaism. Are you telling the history of um, a people with some sort of um, tight connection to, that, that, that it's got its own energy, its own flow, its own identity, that more or less stays the same throughout, or are you talking about something that gets refashioned and reshaped and remade uh, every single time in every in every new context? And and my take on this period um, uh, was to emphasize that that picture of fashioning. What's different, um, I think, between the American case and the case of rabbis in the Galilee, in the land of Israel, in in the the second through the fourth centuries is that rabbis are not, um, they're, they're very much interested in how they're different. Um, and marking that difference, um, they aren't, they're less interested in talking about the question, are we really Romans, right? Are we really Americans? Uh, whereas American Jews are very interested in that question. So in that ancient context, what I'm really interested in is um, how a group of people can be formed in that, in, a, in what was then a, a new and changing context that actually helps pr produce a new form of Jewish identity, a new form of Jewishness. One of the most provocative questions you raise uh, is in the introduction, I, I think, when you, when you talk about the idea that, uh, that there are historians and archaeologists looking at uh, looking at burial sites where there are Greek inscriptions, where there are Latin inscriptions, uh, where there is nothing obviously Jewish as we know it and saying, ah, well, obviously, this is, this is not the Jewish community. And you, and you provocatively suggest, well, 
maybe it is, though you don't really explore that much in the rest of the book. Well, because I'm interested in the opposite of that question. It's how do we know when things are Jewish? And I'm interested in that, in that introduction. I'm interested in the way we all, I mean, I'm not excluding myself from this problem, but, but the right. way in which we end up think, thinking in circles, right? That we end up examining as Jewish the things that we recognize as Jewish, but there also, there's a whole world out there that doesn't, uh, that wouldn't appear Jewish because it doesn't leave physical remains that are identifiable. I, right. I, I, with my students, I often think of, you know, try to think of contemporary examples that might, uh, that might work. So, I th you know, if, if in, you know, 2,000 years, people excavated homes in New York and papers had disappeared and, and organic material disappeared, but there was lots of pottery left, right? It might be that religious Jewish homes were char characterized by the sheer number of the dishes that they had, right? Because you had to have meat and dairy and Passover and not Passover, fancy and not fancy for each of those, right? So that you have, but there was nothing, but unless you knew to look for that, the dishes would be more just nondescript. Right. And so the question is when... What, so the question is how to find, um, well, what, what do you do with the data that does talk about Jews? How do you keep in mind that you're only looking at a small slice? You can see the full interview with Chaim Lappin under the weekly news category on the Jewish Channel On Demand on cable. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.